Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is the last of five in our Fall Integrated Design Lab series. And we've been talking about throughout this series uh, deep renovations. In this particular one, this particular session uh, that I'll introduce in just a moment is going to be very specific with case studies uh, from the practitioners on deep renovations in our area. So. Uh, in just a moment, I'll introduce the panelists. I think everyone's signed in. Um, if you haven't, please do that. Online, if anyone's online watching, I don't think we have an email available tonight. IDL Okay, IDL, IDL at uidaho.edu. If you have any questions for the speakers or comments, uh, please feel free to send those in. Nick will pick them up and we'll try to get your questions out here to the, uh, to the panelists. As usual, we have a time here about 4.30 to 6, and uh, we'll give our panelists uh, hopefully adequate time to talk about their particular projects in deep renovation. So I think I'll go ahead and introduce them. And I'll introduce them and, uh, just, just down the road. This is not the um, order in which they'll speak. Charles Pollan, Musgrove Engineering. Brad Aker, the Integrated Design Lab. Scott Mackey. Engineering Incorporated, Bruce Poe, Modis Architecture, Andy Erstad on the end, Erstad Architecture. So all of them are from this area. We're going to hear some good stories tonight about deep renovation, about projects. And just to get you all started here, we told them the possible topics here are basically barriers to deep renovation. What keeps us from, uh, uh, in the deep re renovation project, from finding that green or finding that energy efficiency? In, in those particular projects. What are those barriers? And then what are the solutions? How, do you, how did you, how do you overcome those barriers? And I'd really like to hear about your projects and your thought processes for, uh, for going through that as, as you go through this tonight. Um, and then from there, if you have any ideas, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll prompt you with these questions as we go along. Uh, design engineering and financing templates, would they be helpful? Do we need something? Do we need, a, do we need a standardized process? Or by the nature of what we're doing, the differences in buildings and building types, the, uh, the, do templates not fit very well there? So kind of like to see that question answered tonight too, if, if, if we can when we go through. And if templates do work, what would they look like? Or what are, what are you using? Basically, what are your processes? So, the title of the, tonight's session, Deep Energy Savings Through Existing Building Renewal. And we're going to start off with Brad Aker, Integrated Design Lab. Brad? Thank you, thank you Ken. Hello, everybody. Um, I was just going to take a few minutes tonight and talk a little bit on benchmarking. Um, you know, our various, um, or our, our basic, you know, the basic concept, you can't manage what you don't measure, um, which everyone, I'm sure, has heard that saying before. Um, there's lots of benchmarking tools out there. Um, you can go buy your own. But luckily, the lab has started to develop a tool loan library. And um, I have a bunch of stuff on the table over here um, that you guys can kind of check out um, or you know, look at after, after the presentation. Um, we have a lot of the, um, our library is pretty focused on energy measurement. So there's a lot of energy loggers you know, current and power loggers, power quality loggers, that sort of thing. But um, we started to get some um, sound decibel meters and stuff like that. Very good. And um, so we have some logging um, decibel meters, um, airflow meters, um, things like that. Um, you've all seen hobos before. Um, you know, this is a watt No, This is part of a, actually this works, good grab, Ken, because these guys work together. Uh, this is Hobo's or Onset Computer Corporation's energy logger. Um, that's pretty nice stuff. Um, so, you know, this equipment's pretty expensive. You know, an energy logger, nice power quality meters, you know, around 1500 bucks, stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of these firms can't afford that kind of stuff. So, um, so Idaho Power funded us to develop this tool loan library. And so you can just, for now, um, I've got some cards over there on the table and um, you can grab a card and get a hold of me. It's got my email address on it. And for now, um, we're just kind of working in person on the loans. 
Um, we're going to develop a, a web-based um, checkout library system in the future, so that'll be neat. I'm sure we'll let you all know about that when that comes along. Um, you know, the standard light meter, you know, that's always handy. Um, I think, yeah, this, and I, I try to get equipment that all locks. So, you know, you can always go get a decimal meter somewhere, but, um, but they don't always lock. So this is kind of, was a really neat one because it logs. Um, and then of course, CO2 monitoring is pretty important. You can watch how that goes up here tonight as all this hot air is exhausted. <laughs> like uh, how much CO2 we get up. But um, anyway, uh, we got the stuff over there. Um, and I want to do a little, because I can't stay for the whole talk tonight, unfortunately. So we want to do a little question and answer just on the tool loan library right now. If anyone has any questions, we could talk about real quick. Um, I have a question yes, to start off, yeah. Brad. Tell us a little bit more about the purpose uh, of all of this monitoring equipment. What are you using it for? Why is it important for the lab and for others to use this equipment? Excellent. Yeah. Well, as I kind of mentioned before, um, you know, benchmarking is, of course, you know, something we believe a lot in. Um, you want to get, you know, before and after shots of your renovations. Um, so, Idaho Power funded us to get this tool loan library together. So, um, firms, especially the smaller firms that can't afford to go out and buy some of this stuff, or maybe they're only going to use it a couple times, can go out and do these measurements. And it'll, it's our hope that it'll really inform your designs um, because you can actually track um, how much power is being used on specific systems, you know. A lot of times you might put in an energy management system in the building and you might put in a few monitoring points on the major um, uses of, of power, but you don't always get down to every piece of equipment. It's just cost prohibitive to do that. Um, but you know, if you're putting in a special kind of drive or a new VFD or something like that, you really want to know how much energy you're saving on a, on a particular item or you know, what the temperatures are like. We, you know, we've got all these hobos you know, typically do temperature as well as um, some of the other ones. These have the external, external channels, so you can hook up other sensors to them, like the CO2 sensor. Um, you know, so we can hook up current sensors to those and, and monitor current in fans and things like that. And um, so that's, you know, basically it's, it's the benchmarking um, is what we're looking for. And then of course I'd probably, you know, like to put in a, a plug for Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's free. Everyone should know about it. If they don't, um, you probably wouldn't be in the room. <laughs> but anyway, that's always a great thing to you know get your clients to start using the portfolio manager tool, and that's a you know really high level benchmarking tool. But these pieces of equipment are really you know you can really um, dive down into the to the really um, nuts and bolts of the benchmarking. So, any other questions before I have to run? I think I'm just about right on time here with my. 10 minutes. What other questions do you have for Brad before he takes off about the lending library and the use of the tools that he has here? Do they have easy instruction manuals? Well, it's all different, you know, they're all different. Um, some of the tools uh, you would need a little bit of training on. Um, some of the tools I probably, you know, wouldn't lend out or like the power quality meters you should really probably be an electrician or be have some sort of education on how to hook up. You know, you don't want to just dive into a panel because um, they're hot a lot of the times. Unless you can get it, obviously it's best to shut it off. Um, but yeah, it's just different tool by tool. Some of them, we don't yet have an infrared camera. We hope to buy one maybe at the end of this year. Look at the budget, see how much money we have left, or next year. Um, and we also want to get an ultrasonic um, flow meter to measure. Uh, water flow and hydronic systems. Those are two, you know, high dollar items, you know, probably seven grand a piece. Um, and they've been requested a lot, especially from the commission agents and stuff in town. So then like those type items, you know, we definitely need to do some training on. And, and the library is evolving. Um, right now we don't have any fee schedules, so it might be a good idea to get in and talk to me. <laughs> um, as it evolves, it, there might be a nominal fee involved. Um, and right now it's also open to anyone, you know, if you want to monitor something at your house, whatever, you know, that's fine. And, and, I, and I think as it evolves, it'll come down to demand. If we have certain tools that are under high demand, 
we may limit them just to the professionals, the architects and engineers in the valley as opposed to homeowner or something like that. But right now it's just all about utilization. Yes, how, how do you get the information out of there, out of the data? Good question. Um, they we, all. We keep that question. Yeah. How do we get the data, the data out of the loggers? Um, they all have their own software, um, and some of it you could download a free trial offline. Some of it um, I would probably download for you and just provide you with Excel files. Um, it probably just depend on the piece of equipment. Um, the the hobos we have handheld um, a little downloader that you can go and actually download and then you could bring that in like if you were still if you know leave the sensors out there for a longer period of time um, you could download it with this and bring it back and and I could get the data off it um, but yeah so there'd be you know working together there too um, and I can also help you know with measurement plans and, and stuff if you you know know the quantity you want to measure but you're not sure how to do it or something like that I can help you with that as well. So you're going to be kind of a technical assistance provider on these tools as well as a lending library. Uh, how much yeah. can they count on lab staff to uh, assist them with either the application of the tools or with processes like uh, downloads and such? Well, that's another good thing to think about as our next funding cycle comes up, you know, as we evaluate how much help people are going to need on it. You know, we might um, provide classes and you'd have to come to a certain class and so we can do it all at once as opposed to me teaching everyone in here, you know, the same thing. Um, that's another one of these finer points that we haven't totally worked out yet. But in general, you know, we're always happy to help a nominal amount, but of course, you know, we can't spend hours and hours with people and you know site visits may or may not be possible um, you know depending where it is and, and that sort of thing. I have a um, question from the web. Yes. And could you Hello, tell web. us tell us a little bit about how you use these tools in an integrated process and maybe Insight Architects would be a good example how you use yeah. them there. Yeah um, yeah we're cur currently over at uh, Insight Architects building uh, we're logging I'm doing a plug load study over there I'm looking at plug loads. Uh, so plug loads are anything that's plugged into the wall, computers, you know, floor heaters, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, specifically in an integrated design process, um, these tools might not really help as much on, you know, the job you just finished, but it's going to help on your next job, you know, as you're, you're logging the job you finished, and you're going to be able to use that data to inform your next design. Um, or maybe you're going to use that data to figure out why, a, you know, you're getting comfort complaints or something like that. You could actually log some temperatures maybe at a, a better interval than the energy management system is currently doing, or maybe there's no energy management system at all. Um, so you can use that, you know, to, to figure out problems with equipment or if you have comfort complaints, things like that. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, but I'm glad to hear some integrated design questions out there. That's great. Good. Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Any other questions for him before fun. we go to the next project? And Oh, yeah, don't forget. So I did leave a couple stacks of my cards over there. Um, okay. Grab a card. Yeah. And thanks, guys. Good. So um, we have a couple folks here that work together, Andy Erstead. From Erstad Architects and Charles Pollan from Musgrove Engineering on 9th and Jefferson. And I think Andy has a, a little slideshow also. Um, why don't you tell us what you're doing with deep inter renovations, please? So, Ken, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a couple of slides that are projects that uh, we have worked closely with Musgrove uh, Engineering on <clears throat> in designing and taking a sustainable approach to design and an integrated approach to design. The number of projects that we have are six or seven. Uh, one is the building in front of you, which is uh, Freedom Storage Vanga Works, which is actually no longer uh, Vanga Works. It's just a freestanding LEED Gold certified building uh, in Meridian. And um, one of probably the first ones that we really wrapped arms around with, with Musgrove. And as I told Charles, I'm just going to introduce the buildings. He can talk about really all the stuff that <laughs> they did to make them work. 
I, I joke about it a little bit, but um, well, that, the, one of the questions is sort of what are the problems or what are the challenges of getting uh, integrated design and um, moving forward in projects um, with, with a client base? And I'm, I suspect that all of us at this front table and all of you that have clients would say that the biggest challenge is money and the perception of money. Um, most people want, and I'll show you a couple projects, most people want sustainable buildings and they want to be like LEED um, and you say, well, you can't be like LEED. You can either be LEED or you're not LEED. And uh, you're, you're either certified or you're not certified. And um, they come back and say, well, use all the same design techniques that you, you can. And we say, well, we will. But unless you're willing to spend the money and go through the process of registering and tracking and the third party, and the, uh, the third party verification, that, that's our biggest challenge. Um, Venga Works is the lead gold building. Uh, we, all these projects we've done with Musgroves, as I said. And I'll go through them, and then Charles, you can hit each of the ones because there's some funny, interesting ones. This is a building uh, for HealthWise up on the corner of Bogus Basin and Harrison Hollow. And it was, uh, as a child growing up, shortly or short distance from here, it started out as an Atlantic Richfield gas station and then became a Bank of Idaho bank and then Teeley's land surveying, and then HealthWise purchased it, and it's their data center, um, and it has heavy loads, um, but again, this was one of the clients that said, we want it to be like, we want it to be a, a certified building, but we don't want to pay for the certification. Um, this is uh, another project, Riverstone International Schools, um, pre-K and uh, lower school, Again, the same thing. They didn't want to spend the money to actually register it and have it certified, but everything that we did and all of our decision processes were informed by um, energy efficiency. Um, Idaho Power gave them a huge rebate check back because of all of the lighting design, things of that nature, and the mechanical system design. So Charles will talk a little bit about that. Um, this project is what we're calling on the boards. It, it actually is uh, out to it's it, the city permits are ready to, to pull on it. It's out for bid. It's uh, Meridian Development Corporation's um, MDC office building that is going to be a tenant, uh, two tenants in the building, uh, VRT, Valley Regional Transit, and Compass. Um, the building uh, has the, the requirement or the request was that we design a building to achieve a silver certification. and. Um, Everything is, in essence, mm -hmm. sort of tracking that way. But again, and we filed for it, so we're really doing the stuff. The client is informed, and, and uh, it, it's the real deal. One of the challenges, and I think Bruce will confirm this and all of us, is that um, there are a lot of potential trip hazards uh, in the process of building these projects, and those trip hazards, uh, in addition to the money from the client side, the trip hazards, if the contractor is uninformed or does um, one of their tradespeople does a stupid, silly mistake, as we call them, uh, can blow out a whole mess of, of credits towards, towards that silver level. So, um, And then we have two other projects that we're working very closely with Musgrove on, and these are projects that we did not design. Actually, I'm not quite that old, but we, uh, this is the 9th and Jefferson, one of my favorite buildings in Boise. Um, the client approached us and said, well, we've dabbled with this, we've looked at LEED, we, uh, we recognize this building as a huge draw to heating, the energy consumption is out, it's outrageous, and all kinds of great things about it. Will you do a study for us and um, to tell us whether or not we should pursue LEED or what sustainable practices we should do? Um, and if we think the sustainable practices and modifications um, are appropriate, we would then consider pursuing lead. So um, the initial study was done. Uh, Musgrove did the mechanical and electrical side. We did the architectural and envelope side. And um, the end result is that the client has authorized us to move forward to uh, pursue certification as an existing building. It's a grand old building. It's geothermal. It has all, all the great bells and whistles. You know, the instant you say geothermal, you sort of feel like you get a, a free pass and you collect $200 and go on the Monopoly board. 
And then this building is one that we did not design either. It's United Heritage. And the same thing, uh, they called the contractor, CMCO, who did the building and said, um, we're five years into this thing. The performances are pretty good. Um, we love the building. Uh, we want to evaluate it because we think we can, we can do modifications and um, we can make it more efficient. So who, who was my first phone call? Charles. <laughs> Um, so these are, these are the, the projects. We have another one that's actually being monitored, and I apologize for not adding it on, and this is the Science Center, at, uh, Boone Science Center at the College of Idaho. And talk about a perfect model for a study, so I'm remiss in not putting that up. Um, IDL is actually going out to do some, some field monitoring based on the modeling that uh, Musgrove did. Uh, when you take an old science building built in the 60s, that had basically free air coursing through it and for those fume hoods that were actually attached to the outside air, pumping air straight out. So uh, conditioned air in, all that air going out the, out the window. So the design is um, that project, probably one of the better models. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so Charles. Okay, um, you know, from our standpoint, I, you know, working through this over the last, you know, really, focusing on sustainability design over the last five or six years, it seems like the protocol of how they go has gotten more smooth. Um, and I think up front, and Andy does a great job of this in his group, is establishing the goals. You know, sitting down, establishing the goals that the client wants, that the users want. Because um, once we know a goal on the project, then we know direction. And, the, and that's, that's the first place. And then the next place is really, um, you know, establishing that benchmark. You know, Brad mentioned benchmarking what we have to start with because you don't know where you need to be if you don't know where you are. And um, the one project, the Jefferson place, where we looked at it, you know, that was a great one. We determined that it, the goal was to be more sustainable and if that meant through a lead process, then go through the checklist and then whatever else we find out through that process is on the table. Um, one of the things that we talked about was doing an Energy Star monitoring on it. Obviously, there's a prerequisite through a lead EB to have an Energy Star rating. And if you've got an old building, brick walls, no insulation, single pane windows, that's very inefficient, then there's substantial costs there to get it to at least a baseline level. And so again, prior to rushing in and spending money, we stepped back, took a look at it. Because of the geothermal and some of the design features that were done 15, 20 years ago to update that building, it actually met the benchmark of 75, which is the requirement of an EV. So we can go in and do improvements, but we know we don't have to break, break, uh, break the bank to actually get there. Um, so again, we know the goals, um, we know our, where we're, um, you know, what our uh, benchmark is, and then really communication. Um, and the communication and one of the tools we used, which Andy mentioned, was energy modeling. Um, if energy modeling is done properly, it's done as a design tool. Um, it's used, it's started up front early in the project and then through design processes or through modification processes, <coughs> through communication with the architect, with the other consultants on the staff or on the project, that we looked at design iterations. And you can compare those energy upgrades, those sustainability upgrades with the cost of those upgrades because no matter what project we have there's no unlimited funds and so we have to find a way with the design team to create a end project through communication and goals that um, meets the budget and uses the mm -hmm. money as wisely as possible and uh, you know and that's what we've done on the Vanguard Works project that you've that you've seen here is it was a tight budget I mean they had money to spend and there was definitely a goal in the function of the building from a usability standpoint, but also a sustainability standpoint. And at the end of the day, we were able to do that. So uh, one of the interesting things, and I go back to this dollars and cents issue, Vanga Works started out with a client that said, we wanna, we wanna do a LEED certified building. And the client, what was really sort of rewarding for us was as the client became more and more educated as we were asking more and more questions mm -hmm. and whatnot. You could just see the gears grinding away and all of a sudden we, we didn't do a very good job of managing the client because the next thing we know he says, I want silver. 
and then all of a sudden it's, I want gold. Well, you know, all of that takes time and money, and we, uh, we sort of allowed them to string us along, and, and um, we considered it a learning curve. It was an investment in, mm -hmm. in, our, in our competency, I guess you would say. The, the other thing that was, um, that based on what Charles was saying, is this budget aspect. The Jefferson, as an, as an example, um, is another client who recognized an amazing asset in a building and an amazing opportunity. And uh, that, that building is a little bit like picking all the low-hanging fruit because it had um, hollow metal, fr exterior hollow metal window frames with single pane glass. It, you might as well just open the window. <laughs> and so things that he knew he was gonna have to do and he was gonna have to invest in, all of a sudden he's saying, well, many of my clients, uh, some, some of my clients are federal government clients, some of my clients are state tenants, uh, and all of those tenant groups are starting to establish criteria that say you, you can go into a building, but it has to be LEED certified if it's older than this, and it has to be LEED silver if it's older than this, and if it's, they're, they're trying, I think the federal government and the governments are trying to push that along as well by helping inform. So you have this client, from our perspective, a client who knew he was going to be spending the money and said, oh, here's an opportunity. And so, gosh, imagine that from our perspective, mm -hmm. um, it, it helps. So. Hey, I got a quick question for you. Um, can you put some numbers to how much extra it costs to pursue those different certification levels, both from like an hour standpoint or a, a percentage over the regular budget? Lots. Let, let me repeat that um, a little bit here so everybody can hear. Put some <clears throat> numbers, please, to how much does it cost to go to these different levels of uh, lead in the renovation? You know, the, the, I think the question is one of those interesting, evolving questions because five years ago, I would have said it's, a, it's probably a 5 to 10% premium on the construction cost. Um, I've sat in... Uh, in meetings where I've had people tell me absolutely it doesn't cost any more to build a certified building. It may not cost any more to build a certified building than a regular building, but what it does cost is the filing and all the time associated with the filing. But the, the nice thing about it is the industry has moved so much in that direction that you almost have to try not to build a building that's certifiable. Um, to go to the, sec to the, to the next levels, uh, I think Bruce may even have some better numbers than I do, some more accurate, appropriate numbers, but um, a lot of it is, um, I think, if you're doing ground up, you can sort of do a percentage of cost, and I would say as you go higher and you required a more intensive, um, more, more intensive, um, gosh, I just lost the term, calibration, what's the third party verification? <coughs> Commissioning. Um, <coughs> As each, a, a standard commissioning is X dollars, an enhanced commissioning is Y dollars, and an enhanced commissioning of special systems is Z dollars. And that becomes part of the, part of the spread and the, and the specific si um, systems that you put in. So it's not a good answer in terms of on a $100,000 project that's going to cost uh, $9,875 more to go for gold. It, I, I think it's more relative to how you're going to approach it and what you are looking to achieve. Oh, and you know, to, to that, if I got just one quick question, is I, on Jefferson and United Heritage, the um, way Erstad approached it I think was the right way is that they, they took a nominal cost to do a study to look at all of the different sustainable measures and lead points and put a dollar value to the construction cost of an upgrade and the cost of doing the work from a design standpoint. And so laid it all on the table, because there is no one number that it's 1%, 5%, 10%. <laughs> it really depends on the type of building it is and the project it is. And the approach they did is, is kind of a new approach that we've just done lately on a few projects that I thought worked well and, and it justified pursuing the, the, the Jefferson project. Sorry, Bruce. Good, that's my, good. My turn. Bruce, yes, Can I just inter interject something? In response to your question about how much it costs, um, we've, Modus, Modus Architecture has done a number of lead buildings and um, we found that the best way to control costs is to, 
number one, get experience as an architect and get experience, get an experienced uh, contractor who have done this before. It's, the learning curve is difficult through the first project and as you get more efficient at it, you learn how to manage your resources better. How do you do that from the design side? We hired a full-time uh, lead administrator. That's all he did. Uh, we had enough when, when you know, the market was hot a couple of years ago. All, he was working full-time tracking projects and pushing the credits through and making sure the contractor was doing what they were, needed to do on their side. But we also write into the specifications and try to get the owner of the uh, developer to uh, get the contractor to um, identify a specific lead administrator on their side. So you have a lead administrator talking to a lead administrator. You don't have a superintendent necessarily talking to a lead administrator or superintendent talking to a project manager, which you, you can do that. But they're typically too concerned with everything else going on in the project. And so if you have that type of communication present, then the credits are much easier to track. The credits on the contractor side and keeping the subcontractors in line, which is the big trick, uh, is much easier to do. And then documentation just becomes a daily you know, routine for who's ever doing it. If you set the documents aside and don't pay attention to them for a week, you've got a problem because a lot of things can go wrong in that week's period of, or that, that period of time. You know, the other thing is that um, also up front, just educating everybody and getting everybody in a room. This is what the integrated design process is all about. But making sure they take that seriously and you bring them in the room and say, this is how the project's going to work. This is what you have to do. And if you don't do it, you've got a problem. Now you're talking to subcontractors typically. and You can write into the specifications and into their contracts that they've got to provide you certain information and so you kind of got them by the throat and unfortunately that's what you have to do a lot of times. It's the way you administrate the project. So and again and then you look at it from the construction cost side um, you know it is it the same holds true on the construction side is that if you have an experienced contractor who knows what they're doing and can really fine-tune this then the costs drop considerably. The administrative costs do and then if you're pursuing platinum, obviously you've got to, um, you're incurring costs for high performance uh, infrastructure, you know, the, the systems, if you're doing that. However, I do have a, when it's my turn to talk, no. uh, I have a, an example of a project I'll talk about briefly that is not using high tech and it's going for platinum. So uh, that's my comment. Good. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask uh, Charles and Andy. If you can talk a little bit more about your um, client relationship, and you you talked about early on setting goals, can you give us a, a um, little deeper idea of what that process is like working with that client, getting those goals out there, make um, doing the doing the study, bringing that back to them. How does that become an integrated uh, process or selections uh, on, on what they want to do? Can you talk a little bit more about that? You know, um, the, the process and the integrated process is, is a critical component. And um, I, I think I would be trying to pull the wool over everyone's eyes if I didn't tell you honestly that uh, when a client comes to us and says, it indicates a willingness to pursue uh, lead certification, that the very first thing that's done is ask them what their budget is and two, go through the, go through the checklist. And, um, you know, the checklist is not the tool that designs the project. The che checklist is merely the benchmark. Brad talked about uh, talked about these benchmarks of, of measurement. But um, as you design it, um, as you design a project and you go through that process, there are components in the checklist that you absolutely know are are not achievable. It, they're they're regional based components. Um, and you also know that there are things very much within grasp uh, if there's a willingness to, um, to buckle down and go for it. And so the education of the client is, is huge. And um, we, we have all these clients that have hit the buzzword, um, sustainable design and lead certified and, um, you know, we want our building to be a model. And 
we all want our buildings to be models. I, I think we strive to do the right thing and do, do the right building. Um, but we have to educate the client that there is a little bit more than just uh, what Charles and I do and what our staff does and what our interaction with our client and the entire design team. And in many cases, we actually we bring the agencies into the process. Um, so once the client understands that, and, and again, that's one of those hurdles. Uh, getting them educated, as Bruce said, um, that's one of your very, very first steps. Um, we're lucky because we've had willing, willing clients with deep pockets, and um, gosh, that's a, you know, that's a, a dream client. And we've had clients that that uh, have wanted to pursue the sustainability as an as an approach. Um, and we constantly remind them, unless you're willing to walk the talk, you can't call yourself a certified building. And um, so from the integrated design standpoint, um, Charles and I talked about this a lot, and that is we never get very far down the road without Charles or Shelby or somebody in their organization saying, wait a sec, this is inconsistent with what you've told us or inconsistent with what we've heard from the client. And um, those, are the, those are the checks and balances that a, I, I think an honest, open-minded, good team uh, is able to you know, push back and forth on in that process. And, and um, I, I love Bruce's model of, of the lead coordinator. And um, I, I think we have a number of lead, of lead certified projects. And I didn't go into it as focused as, as uh, Bruce did saying, I've, there's the person and I want that person who is a very good, by the way, a very sharp character. Um, I, had a, I had a young intern who um, jumped into this project uh, with me, our eyes open, but uh, they were in the back of our heads instead of in the front of our heads. And so we got a good lesson in sort of refocusing the vision and, and, um, and grabbing, our, grabbing the idea and running with it and learning with it. I mean, we, we, as I said, the cost to do this was an investment in, in the company, if you will. Um, and, um, but you... So, so Andy, again, you're um, jumping in like that, eyes in the back of your head. Are you saying that uh, uh, you really did not know quite what you were biting off there when you well, I, I would ask. Into I, it, I would ask anyone here who's done a, a lead certified project, if you went into that project knowing exactly what was going to happen. Right. I, I can honestly tell you, I, I want to come work for you because um, I thought I knew everything. I'd been, I'd, I'd achieved my lead AP in 2000. Um, it was one of the things to do, and. Uh, we just kept talking about sustainability and talking about it and watching the USGBC get, you know, get energy behind it and wheels and de developing and evolving and sort of becoming more and more legitimate as, a, as uh, an organization and a, and a third party kind of, if you're going to do it, you've got to really do it. So um, we, w we went into it thinking we knew what we were doing. And, and the outcome of it is I now, have a, I now have a person on my staff who every single lead project goes through, but I have three other people. I have nine people that are lead AP in my office, and there's not one except myself, quite candidly, that I wouldn't put um, a whole application in front of because okay. they're all doing it now. So this is the, just the lead process of itself is a, is a, is a good learning experience. It's a, it's a fabulous ex experience. It's a fabulous experience as a design uh, tool from a collective standpoint also because the integrated process makes you work with your colleagues. Okay. Ken? Yes. Question. Uh, my question is for uh, Andy and Bruce, either one of them. But, uh, this summer we had guest speakers that were involved in a high level in the, in the project of, of some important buildings in Boise. And uh, what alarmed our group is that they said that they, their intent was to build in the spirit of leads. And that is a very shocking statement when you're addressing a sustainability group like ours. Uh, 
for us, it was practically uh, sacrilege. Uh, we're very close to it. So my, con my question for you two is, does the USGBC have a problem on their hands addressing something that could become uh, pervasive in the, in the built environment? Yes. Um, they, I've, I've served on, for the USGBC, I'm currently serving on the Western Regional Council, which is nine Western states. And you know, founded the USGBC chapter here, and have also served on a national chapter steering committee dealing with all these these types of issues. And so I've got, I can tell you that this started long ago. This is a conversation within the USGBC at a national level, but what to do about this? Well, you know, uh, there's a particular organization out there right now, Green Globes, and this is my favorite, you know, one that was created funded by the vinyl industry in response to G USGBC's position on vinyl when the USGBC first created LEED. And um, you won't find the vinyl industry written for uh, Green Building Institute is what it is. Green Building Institute has green globes. And then the forest industry came in and funded it also. And so they've developed the green globes, which is a feel-good type of way of putting a green globe on your chest and saying, I'm green. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. You can go online, you can answer their questions, and you can be certified. So um, in a real sense, there's some damage being done out there in the industry by greenwashing and by trying to confuse the market. And, um, and it's, you know, those of us who know what's, uh, what's going on, it's, I think, our duty to kind of try to clarify that. But um, in response to that, you know, when you get that kind of watering down of any type of system that you use, and they say, well, we're going to do it in the spirit of whatever system it is, uh, when, you, when they get done, how are they going to quantify it? How are they going to measure it? How are they going to prove it? I mean, it could be anything. And so, I mean, that's where the danger lies so in this So, effort. I want to get you on that point, deep into that point, because uh, we started out they're focusing a little bit on lead, but now we're talking about how that relates to the building, uh, right? That's where you're going with this. So I really want to ask you how it does relate to the building, not to not to lead, pro, not not to have a conversation about lead, good or bad, but from a deep renovation standpoint, uh, how how is lead helpful to that process in a building? And it, it gives lead. Through the integrated design process, you develop goals, you extract the goals at the beginning of the project out of your clients, out of the building uh, tenants, out of the uh, operations manager, out of the engineers, whoever is involved with that building. You extract those goals out, and typically it's, it's uh, directed by the client. You try to extract that out. And once you develop what those goals are, then you start going through all the credits, and you start assigning the credits to the goals and see how you can reach and achieve those goals by using this system of credits, which is part of the integrated design process. And so it gives you a very defined pathway to achieving what your client wants. And that is extremely important. And it puts everybody on board at the beginning. Everybody is uh, in agreement because they walk out of the room and you've developed it together. You're a team. And so as you proceed forward, you just keep using that as the touchstone all the time. And it, it's, as far as efficiency goes, it, it, uh, it's very efficient for the design team. It's very efficient for uh, the contractor because they know they were there. They should have been, they, if you can get the contractor on board in the beginning. And so ultimately, ultimately what you're doing is you're streamlining the construction process. You're giving the owner a better building. And, um, and you're doing it in a more efficient way. And hopefully everybody's making, you know, uh, because of that, they're making a bit more money because they aren't wasting time chasing their tails. And, and uh, you know, that's my response to that, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, Andy and, and then uh, Doug had a question, but Andy first, and then we're gonna come back to some engineer talk here too. So I think, Greg, I talked a little bit about sort of this, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is that, is the dollar issue. It's the enlightened client. Dollar, enlightened client, and ultimate vision and goal that are the, that are the big challenges. And the one thing that, that I constantly tell our clients that want to be, you know, they want to design in the sustainable model, I say, that's fabulous. We'll, we'll help you do that. But if you want to be certified, at any level, 
you need the independent third-party verification that what I, tell, what I tell you and what my design team and what all of us sitting around the table tell you is going to happen actually happens because without that third-party verification, I can, tell, I can tell you stories for days. You'd be all asleep and tired and bored, but um, we've, pro projects that we've done, our engineers have been involved in them. Charles, I won't name you on this one. Um, <laughs> The, the, uh, the <clears throat> mechanical units getting put in, in the right location, reversed. Polarity on the motors hooked up by the electrician, reversed. Whole wings of, of um, or whole zones in mechanical systems totally uh, not working. But all the parts were there, it looked good, the plugs were, you know, the connections were great, everything was done. And <clears throat> the, it, the third party verification and the commissioning of the building, you walk in and somebody who doesn't have anything to do with the, with the project um, says, gosh, um, no wonder this room is hot because it's blowing, uh, it's blowing all the air the wrong direction and now it's compromised two other rooms. You know, th those are, that's maybe a little extreme, but it, it, it truly did happen. Um, so it's that, it's that third party verification that's so critical, that, that l separates lead from GBI and Green Globes and all of those people. Um, and I, I like your term, a feel good, because um, w we actually had a, a client who um, didn't want to pursue, wanted to, to have some kind of moniker on their, on their project and didn't like the idea of the cost for filing for and pursuing lead. And so we chased, we chased our tail around, and the more I learned about it, the more I realized that it, was not a, it wasn't a prudent avenue to go down for a number of reasons, um, professionally, but it wasn't doing my client any good to, to say that they were green globes. So. Good, thank you. Doug, you had a comment or a question? Yeah, it's not really a question, more of a devil's advocate comment. Okay. Uh, about the sacrilege comment. Uh, the mission statement of the USGBC is to promote rebuilding. It doesn't say anything about me. You know, I think they would like to educate the public about rebuilding. Doing lead is great if you can. You don't have to do that. Uh, I'd also say that in our practice, we've done integrated designs since before lead existed. And I think a lot of architects have. And so that's not necessary, or lead is not required for that. And commissioning is a separate issue also, which is just for lead. So I'm all for lead, and we try to do as many as we can also, but it's not the only path, and it's not the only path for a good green building. Okay. Thank you. It is the path that has developed from a grassroots effort. I mean, everything else that I've seen has come from top down. This is from the people that got together, decided to do it, and all these chapters sprung up organically around the country, and to me, that's pretty powerful. So, uh, it's not perfect, but uh, I'm gonna hang in there with them, so. And I, and I, I, I agree with you that there are other ways to do it. Um, obviously, the living building but challenge. I, I also agree with that. I think the reason for the power of lead is the fact that it is a third party certification. The third party is the powerful that. piece. That's why it's been so powerful with a large community. Sure. Yeah. You know, in light of that, and I think, Doug, your comment's very appropriate. The state of Idaho will not do a building without, um, without fundamental commissioning. You have to commission every state of Idaho, DPW, and typically BSU, U of I, uh, all of these state projects have to be commissioned. But they don't necessarily pursue lead. So they're pursuing, in essence, part of the sustainable nature of, of taking care of and making sure that the in installations and applications are appropriate. But right. So uh, let's move a little bit to Bruce, your stories, uh, uh, and Scott, and your partnership. Okay. Well, and, you know, we were at originally asked to come and speak specifically about one project, which is the new integrated design lab uh, over here at. Uh, the front five building a couple blocks down and I, I will get to that um, uh, but I would like to talk just a bit I, don't, I didn't bring a bunch of slides uh, Mandy was ahead of me on that one but uh, 
we uh, <laughs> we have uh, we've done a number of projects here in the in the valley. We've uh, the Boise Watershed Project, which is the city interpretive center at the wastewater treatment plant, is a lead silver. Um, we uh, recently did one for Idaho Power up in McCall, which was their first lead building, which is um, their, uh, it's an operation center, but we achieved lead gold on that, um, which was an interesting effort because with Idaho Power, there's a very traditional way of running their corporate business. And it took about three months after we were approached to do this to go through middle management and to get all the way to the CEO, seriously to the CEO. I had to educate middle management as to how this process was going to work. And then the emissary was sent to the CEO to go, you know, lay it out in front of him and he gave the nod yes. And it came in on budget and it came in at a higher, rather than silver, which we were shooting for, it came in at gold. And I have to go back and I tell you that the reason it got to gold is because we had a full-time lead administrator who was just focused on this thing, and we required the contractor to have some a point person doing the same thing, and so not one credit escaped us. Um, but you know the existing building stock, which I think is going to be the huge, huge, uh, you know, elephant out there, that um, because we have run into a, you know we all know those of us who are in construction and architecture that a lot of new buildings aren't springing up around. We're getting, whatever work we have is probably with existing buildings we're renovating. Um, I think that is going to be a huge push in our profession to, to make the existing building stock more efficient. And I think that's what we should be looking at. And the project that we're working on right now for IDL is one of those types of buildings. Um, the building that you, the IDL is going to be moving into is that the one that's attached to it is Concordia University. Um, that used to be my building that I had my office in, and uh, they purchased it, and now they're building their law school there, which will be and that building that we were in was a the first uh, LEED certified building in Idaho, and then they are now attaching to it another LEED certified building. So they're they're going to recertify the entire project, which is nice to see. I wish I was the architect, but they brought their own along from Portland. Um, now we ex we are moved. We've moved into the Fidelity Building downtown here, and uh, the owner of the building and some of the tenants we are pursuing very slowly. But we're pursuing trying to make that particular building a real model of taking an existing building and turning that into a much more sustainable green building, which will be an interesting process. Given specific. What are some specific measures that have, have happened or that you're targeting to do? In that building? Yeah. I've got all kinds of things. I can, I can, there, right now, it's all just visionary stuff. Uh, we haven't done anything specifically, uh, but it's something that I need to talk to the lab about and uh, we need to discuss because I've got some good ideas with the equipment that you have and the approach I want to take to it. So we can save that for another conversation. Um, another project that I... I don't know if you can pull up, uh, can you pull up a web page on this thing? Or? I'm sure. Um, dial up, uh, I just want to speak briefly about this. Dial up uh, Jade Mountain, St. Lucia. We were tapped into uh, about two and a half years ago by a, a, a pro, uh, owner of a resort down in St. Lucia, which is way down in the Caribbean, Caribbean down by Venezuela. Venezuela. Huh? What is it? Jade Mountain, J-A-D-E, Mountain St. Lucia. And he's an architect by training from Canada. He, he's been down there for, he hasn't really practiced much architecture. He had designed this, this building called Jade, Jade Mountain. And he wanted to use us, MODIS, uh, to get it certified. And so we're working on the platinum certification for this thing. And um, we, What's interesting about it is that it's in a third world country. It's a very, very high-end resort. Every room is like this. Now, I'll just speak very briefly to it. And Charles was down there at the time. We went down and uh, worked on this as a team. Each room has a reflecting pool like this, has that view. Each room has, is open to the Caribbean. So it, it, it does not have glass. It does not have a wall but it has three walls that define it, and there are 29 rooms stacked on about five stories. 
And it, uh, it gets its cooling with fans, with trade winds, and with the evaporative cooling of the pools. It uses potable water that it collects from an old reservoir that was built by the French and British in the late 1700s and 1800s, early 1800s, to gather 1.5 million gallons of rainwater to then be used to power um, sugar uh, water wheels to, to crush sugar cane. They brought that back to life and put a new shot creek uh, basin in this thing. And now they're gathering rainwater and then they're filtering it for potable water at the resort. The, all the effluent, the sewage that comes out of the resort is pumped to a constructed wetlands that's up in the rainforest that goes down and it filters through gravel matrix and sand matrix, reeds, plants pull out impurities. And so as you look at this and where the, where the gray water first enters into this constructed wetlands, the plants are low and as it goes downhill for about 200 yards, they get taller and taller and taller because they're getting, you know, the impurities are being taken out. It's like a graph, it's like a living graph. They then take those plants and they harvest those and plant those around the resort. They have an organic farm where they grow all their food for their restaurants. In the plazas around the resort, they've got um, green, green plants that they serve in the restaurants and they harvest every day. I mean, I could go on and on about this place. Um, and uh, it's pretty fascinating. And I'll, at some point in time, I would like to do a presentation here and take you deep into this particular project. Now the challenge that this project has given us is that we're two and two, over two years into it. Scope creep that Andy talked about. It started out, well, we can certify this. We certainly can do that, but this is unusual. And then it went from silver to gold to platinum. And uh, you know we're getting yanked along with this, which is, it's okay, but it's not okay. But it's, you know, we're gonna pull it off, I think, and it'll be, it'll be a, a really nice project to have done. Um, the other thing is that right now we have a, those of you who are familiar with LEED, we have a credit interpretation request in. And that's based upon the interpretation of ASHRAE 90.1 and what is an enclosed room and what's not an enclosed room. Because when you model it from a mechanical engineering standpoint, you've, the, the system, or at least ASHRAE defines an enclosed room as being enclosed entirely. And so, is a room without a wall enclosed or not enclosed? Well, it came back from the reviewers and they said it's not enclosed and so we're gonna kick out all your modeling. Does that make sense? It doesn't make any sense at all. This is the most sustainable building I've ever worked on, the greenest building. And so um, I had to go way up the line. I mean, I'm, I'm talking way up the line in the USGBC to raise this red flag and they have taken special care with this to get it directed to their best people and I'm not going to let this one go. So I'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of pans out. <coughs> anyway, and then let's get back to. You know. well, I'd like to. I'd like to hear um, from Scott, and just maybe you want to talk about the front five, or from an engineer's perspective, where you fit in uh, with, with these processes on existing buildings. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, um, on the front five building that we were uh, doing with Bruce. For the IDL, um, the, I think one of the big challenges with a renovation is that, well, like it's already been said, it's the budget. Well. And uh, there are lots of things you can do to make the building more energy efficient, but you have to decide which ones are the highest priority. Um, adding insulation to the building envelope isn't necessarily the way to go because it's really expensive, usually. Um, but um, at the front five building, we didn't really do anything to the envelope except for change out all the glazing to high performance glazing. Um, and we left the, the rest of the envelope was all the same. And then we ended up putting in more of a high performance mechanical system with um, you know, variable refrigerant um, and being able then to, to use the mechanical side of it to try to help us get a high performance system that way. Um, How did you come to these decision points that these were the best strategies to use for that building? Well, it's kind of, 
you just have to keep asking questions. And in this case, since the IDL was the tenant, uh, they were very educated with what they wanted. And so we had, we just worked to implement their goals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about challenges. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard being on the other end of the table from Erie. And he says, this is what my loads are. Um, <laughs> and oh, OK, well, <laughs> I guess I'm going to take you for your word on that one, Erie, and, and just use your information. Uh, but that, that is part of the, the process, too, where you know, if the building envelope doesn't change and you're concerned about loads, you have people, lights, and equipment that are pretty much the only things you can work on. But you really need to get a good idea of how many people are going to be in there and what their schedule is so that you can model it as accurately as possible because you are trying to get the savings as big you know, as, big as you can mm -hmm. so that you can end up you know, financing part of the renovation of, with the energy savings or however you work it. But um, it, so it's challenging that way because you can't just, I know I'm probably revealing mechanical engineering secrets. But, we want that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the, there's lots of fudge factors that end up going in where, you, you know, you use two watts a square foot for the lighting design and you use uh, more people maybe than or you, you use the number of chairs as the number of occupants, but that may or may not be true. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's kind of a, there's a safety factor built in and a lot of engineers are comfortable with that. But for getting the high performance building, you really have to strip away that comfort factor and kind of get to the raw part. Um, you want it as lean as possible so that you can, you know, uh, yeah, you know, this is a really good example of what uh, was being discussed a little earlier about, well, do you certify it or not? The owner of the building didn't want to do that, and so we weren't going to do it. But we we're going to do as much as we could uh, to make it as green as we could. Now, we had, a, like we said, we have an educated tenant, and the, the, you know, the, the lab is really on top of what specifically they want. They know exactly the type of equipment they want. They went out and searched for the type of skylights to be donated. And, um, and so um, it's going to turn out, and when it's complete, um, it's going to turn out to be a very interesting lab. It's going to be a functioning space. It's going to be a laboratory where the skylights work and, and different skylights are being put in to show how the different skylights uh, distribute light and, and, and so on. And all it's, it's going to be all naturally lit. Um, but again, uh, the challenge here was to get all of that into an existing building with a building owner that didn't really want to do it. But we found creative ways to make most of it happen. And it took a lot of effort to make it happen. Uh, tell us about one of those creative ways. How did that work? Far away. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know. I guess one of them was that uh, there was an existing package rooftop unit on the, on the building to begin with. And initially, we, had, uh, we were going to remove it and replace it with the uh, variable refrigerant system. And uh, I guess the, the system just kind of got too big and too unwieldy. Um, and it came back from the owner where we really just don't want to do that, um, mostly, I think, for budget reasons. But, um, but it was affecting other areas that weren't going to be in the IDL tenant space as well. And so mm -hmm. we just kind of said, OK, well, let's keep that existing rooftop unit. We'll just put the variable refrigerant system in the, the sp spots where IDL is going to occupy it. And uh, I think that turned out to be a lot better for the the owner and the tenant in the end. So. Yeah, and then we had, um, we had Kevin and Gunner going out there, you know, scouring around, talking to reps. Uh, one of the, there's a new system out, which is a high-pressure high uh, Gunner. Which one are we talking about? <laughs> is it going in or not uh, at this point? The, the Daikin stuff? Yeah. Um, I don't think that, I think it's a single, the mini split and the, the two split. I don't think it's yeah. that. And the, the reason I have to ask is because of a unique relationship we've got here. <laughs> it's been interesting. Um, and they also have got, in order to save costs, they're getting a, uh, 
a control system in that's all wireless for a lot of the lighting. So we aren't having to run conduit and so on. They're, they're, they're getting that donated. Okay. It's, uh, and so when I say creative, I mean creative in the sense of the IDL has a reputation. They can go out and identify potential reps that will donate equipment, and then we have to react to it, which has been yeah, the fun that, part. That's something you don't <laughs> see in every project. No. That's, far, far yeah, that's definitely one thing I've seen in a lot of renovation projects is the use of wireless controls because it's, okay. it's a lot of money to go and tear into a lot of the walls. and. Um, it may be a, maybe a slight upgrade in cost for the actual, the, whatever system is being controlled, it's mostly lighting, but. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and they actually have a mechanical system out there now where all the thermostats are wireless and they, once they're installed, they do an integrated wireless link. And so mm -hmm. one stat can go down, but it still keeps the link going. So it's, the technology is coming and it's fairly affordable these days. That sounds good. Mike had a question back here. So given your more typical clients, not the ones who are well-educated and get donations all the time, um, <laughs> there's always, the, how do you push your clients up the ladder closer to, if they don't actually do certification, at least get them closer to that? They're, I can't, I've been lead AP for a few years now. I have not done a lead project that is finished as lead. Everybody says, I want to do sustainable. Then you start talking numbers and things start falling apart. How do you push them to at least get them closer to doing things more sustainably, either new construction or renovation, you know, to get around some of those things? Because it seems like lots of them, you know, they, they want the Mercedes badge on, the, on their Hyundai or what, whatever it is, you know. They, they don't actually want to go all the way. They think they want to, and then they start looking at some of the hard decisions and things start falling apart. So how do you get them further up the ladder? And not only education-wise, what the process is, but also get them to open up those purse strings a little bit more, because there's always the trade-off with you know initial costs with long-term ownership. Good, good question, Mike. Yeah. So, so Andy? I, I can jump in. The, the last two uh, lead um, building evaluations, the pre-lead building evaluations that we've worked on with with Charles and Shelby, um, <clears throat> regardless of the of the willingness of the client or or whatnot. One of, the most, one of the most valuable tools that came from both of those studies, and it was designed, we designed these studies to result in um, a, basically a cost spreadsheet that said, for X dollar investment, you can anticipate netting a Y dollar return. And if there's not any other tool around that's more successful, um, than that, because you you tell a client that they may spend twenty thousand dollars up front in in the fourth quarter Q Q four twenty twenty ten, but by fourth quarter of twenty fifteen, they're actually going to have paid that investment back, and and actually are generating revenue off that investment, basically by the return on their dollars. Um, most of our clients, even if they don't want to pursue um, lead, they, but they want to pursue su a sustainable approach, that's one of the first things they're going to see is um, the, the, the biggest hurdle is the, is the first time cost. But if you can balance that with a life cycle cost model that shows them the benefits, a lot of times they'll, they'll get there quicker. You know, we're in a bad, a bad economic time. I think, actually, we, we all know too well. Um, and so, clients are even now being more, more focused on their dollar investments. But a lot of them are starting to realize that, uh, that if they look beyond the first cost and go to the life cycle cost, that they're that they're much better off doing it up front. Um, and, and so this, this evaluation that Charles and our firm, Musgrove and Erstad, have put together kind of gives them that roadmap. And all of a sudden, you see the light, the light go on like, oh, there's money to be had in essence. You want to send me that spreadsheet? So yeah. what I'm going to do now <laughs> is open it up to questions. We have um, conceivably 20, 21 minutes left, and, but maybe We'll do this in 10. It depends on what our questions and what our dialogue is. So, Gunnar. OK. Um, this might be more for, for, for you guys. Um, doing 
looking at existing buildings, there's a lot more upfront work, obviously, <coughs> because you need to do a lot more investigation. Um, using audits, um, have you, first, I guess, obviously, I'm sure you've, you guys have probably done a few through your offices. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how have they been used? Um, what data points were studied? How would those, how it's, what data would be useful in design? Um, both of the, the architecture, the interior space, and the systems. And then um, what maybe doesn't get studied that, that should be studied, that you, you know, stuff that you think maybe left out of audits. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. You know, there's, we've done our audits, which is a good example of, have been anywhere from a, a small audit through Auto Power, they call it a scoping audit, and we've done probably 20, 25 of those over the last two years. And unfortunately, there's a lot of good information in those, but there is a limited amount of time, and a lot of the owners or users haven't followed through and used them. And it's unfortunate because there is a lot of low hanging fruit, and I should say that. I think the low hanging fruit gets picked up quickly because that's easy to see, but capital investments that are listed in there typically haven't, um, primarily because it's probably the economic time. Um, then there's been enhanced audits, which can be um, an energy model like we've done with uh, Andy and his firm on the uh, College of Idaho, the Boone Hall, which um, Integrated Design Lab is doing some testing on. That was used to um, generate higher efficiency um, system options and designs and also provide some payback through utilities to help justify some of the costs that they did up front. Um, and then we, Mike, who's in the audience here, who's talked a few minutes ago, he did a pretty extensive audit over at St. Alphonsus. And uh, we, we tackled a few pieces of mechanical systems specifically and really looked into them. And again, there was some very low hanging fruit. And you know, what came out of that is they had no capital money, just like everybody else. But the non-capital items that we addressed were put up front. And they were, they were done because they could do those internally because they had the manpower already there. And what they were seeing was 10% savings on their energy. I mean, in the entire hospital. And so when you, when you see that, all of a sudden you pique their curiosity because they think, well, if we can save it on low hanging fruit, maybe it's worth investing up front because these paybacks might be right. And now they're actually starting to allocate money for large capital improvements that you know, if the payback is here, we've proved it, it should be here in the capital improvements and they're moving forward on those. So it's a learning experience. And some of them have followed through, like St. Alphonsus and College of Idaho, some haven't. I guess maybe it's, it's, have they used the savings as a financial mechanism to pay for the capital? The low hanging fruit essentially pays well, for the- Well, you know, on a large corporation like that, the savings never comes back to yeah. the facility and maintenance. But it gives them a tool to make an argument. And I think that's what it's done is, is now they can go in and walk to their supervisor or the, the CEO and say, the proof's here. We've just saved you $30,000 a month in energy savings. Give us the opportunity and we'll do it in other places. And so you, you, if, you don't have a, if you don't have a case study or an example, they aren't gonna listen to you. And so that's what's helped them. So that's, uh, that, that brings up a really good piece of this in, in my opinion. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of gold mines out there. And uh, I think a lot of times our approach to this process is that, uh, oh, we don't have enough money to in invest in our buildings. I'm talking existing buildings. We don't have enough money to invest to get these savings. But what I just heard you say here is that bottom line, that might be the smartest, one of the smartest moves they can make mm -hmm. in a facility. Can we, uh, any, anything else about that, Andy? I think one of the things that, that a study like, we've, we've been completing these last two studies, uh, the illustration, uh, and, and one of the things we do in our studies also, working with Charles and, and staff, is we prioritize, um, we prioritize the kind of results and say, if you, if you pursue these um, upgrades, then you're gonna see these returns and we, we try and we try and we try and encourage the whole meal deal so that they'll go after a certification level, but we also recognize that sometimes um, they're not gonna they're not gonna pursue the certification immediately. So then we say, well, these are the low hanging fruits. These are the most important ones to get taken care of. You know, get rid of your 
hollow metal storefront doors and, and windows and single pane glass and go to a high efficiency assembly. It'll st you can still get it to match the historic flavor, et cetera, et cetera. Well, th they're planning to do that anyway, but, but you can now put a dollar cost to it and, and a value. Uh, one, one thing that we didn't talk about, and I'll just mention it real quickly because of the integrated design. On, on both of these projects, we had a general contractor involved. They were, they were part of the process from, from the get-go, from day one. And um, that, uh, I will tell my clients that I do not do cost estimating. I am not, I am not a contractor. I don't swing a hammer every day. I, I can't stay up with the trends. So we almost always go into a project with a general contractor involved. And they take over the modeling, the cost modeling, and they verify and validate the systems that Charles is recommending to be incorporated that we've collectively designed or thought of or meeting the requirements of the team, so. Good. So, uh, uh, thank you, Andy. Ask that again, and uh, again, it's open for questions out here, but I still kind of heard there that there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, um, can we mine for that opportunity? Should you, as architects and engineers, be pushing, in a sense, these building owners out there to look at what they have, the potential in their, in their buildings for uh, retrofits, for energy efficiency measures? Make a cold call and go through their building? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm asking if there is a process, um, not necessarily a cold call, but what process would, would you use? How do, we, how do we start getting that market moving forward? Wow, you know, it, um, on the on the larger facilities, there's typically a group out there pushing it for you. But on the small buildings, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, that that's that's not a that's not a market or an avenue that we've really pursued. Um, you know, the way that the scoping audits are funded are through Idaho Power, and those are typically only funded for large customer users or large energy users. Um, you know, a, a building even such as this probably doesn't meet the. Um, the minimum energy requirements to do a scoping audit. And so it's it's tough. Now, and if there's funding dollars out there to, to do it, but there absolutely is very low hanging fruit. And maybe it's a maybe it's just educational and forums like this for building owners and building users and presenting those the information that's came out of past studies because a lot of it's um, somewhere in every building we go through. Um, same thing when we did school audits um, here this last year. You know, you could pretty much walk into a school, look at the age of it, and know the first four or five things that needed to be done in that school um, because it was consistent with the age of the construction, with the age of the maintenance, the type of the school. Um, and so if, th if there was a way to present those, get those out to the users, even if it's just in a flyer or a handout with the help of IDL, um, you know, if, if you find, I mean, I own, we own our building, and if somebody came to us and said there's an opportunity to look at it, save money, absolutely, you're going to do that. But how do you do it on a small user group? I don't know. Okay. Bruce, you, you know, know? Yeah, I, you know, I, there are, there are, you've got to create a market. You can't shove things down people's throat. People don't, don't, I don't like it, and I don't think any of you would like it. Building owners particularly don't like it. Um, and so what you have to do is you have to create the awareness. And within our Treasure Valley here, we do have organizations that are trying to do that. Um, one of those is the United States Green Building Council, Idaho chapter, okay? That's, they do a lot of education. They're out there touching the lives of a lot of people. We also have got, you know, the Idaho Green Expo, those of you who are familiar with that. That's a big event. The whole idea is to try to bring this message of sustainability, and maybe not specifically on buildings, but to raise awareness of everybody out there, the consumers, the people in our communities. And that draws, you know, 12,000 people over a two-day period. Every it has for the last four years. And there's there's another organization. Well, and there's GreenWorks Idaho, which is, um, which runs the expo. Which, essentially, it has about 250 business small business members that are sustainable, and about 2,000 individual members. And the, again, the whole idea is to raise awareness within the small business community. But then one other organization that has just formed over the last two years is the Idaho Energy Collaborative, which is an organization. It's, it's not a nonprofit. It's, it's, it has no legal structure. Uh, the other two are nonprofits. What it is, is is a collaboration of about 30 to 40 organizations, and we have monthly meetings. And, um, and it's, 
we just had one yesterday, and we bring experts to the table representing all these organizations to discuss these issues, you know, about buildings and what's happening in the world and energy. And what has come out of that is a very powerful um, group that is getting the attention of state legislators, and they are coming to us to ask our opinion about how to write legislation and so on. And we also had the opportunity to brief all of the candidates. We had 20 candidates you know, in the room, governor, candidates for the governor, candidates, you know, senators, legislators. And, and it, they wanted to know specifically about these types of issues. And so it's a matter of education. It's, it's creeping into our political system and it's also creeping into our, our codes, our energy codes. ASHRAE 90.1, which I mentioned earlier, ASHRAE has taken the lead on developing new green standards for mechanical uh, systems performance. Those are being codified and, and are getting into our codes. And so all of those things are the way that this gets done. I mean, you can't expect to, I think, to, to just be able to present it to building owners and, or developers and have, them, have an aha. Some of them do. But uh, it's happening all around us, and it, it's, it will happen. It's just going to take a little time. Good. Thank you. You know, in, in, in addition to what Bruce has said, I think one of the interesting organizations out there, which is somewhat inextricably tied to IDL, is a little company called Idaho Power. And uh, we've mentioned almost every one of our projects, your projects. Um, if there isn't, if there's one company out there that, that is doing, um, I think, probably <coughs> the largest beneficial jobs for us is Idaho Power. And, and it's, it's kind of an indirect benefit, but uh, College of Idaho got a, almost a $100,000 check from Idaho Power for tra changing out all of their 1968 um, toxic fluorescent light. And now they actually, you can actually see in the building. I, I'm a graduate of the C of I, so um, in, in the 70s when I was a student there, the building was old. And uh, you can imagine when we got into it. But Idaho Power is, is providing these very, what I would call very topical programs for all of us to get involved in. Uh, and, and it's one of the components we bring to almost every one of our clients that wants to have their buildings evaluated. And it's um, e even a five-year-old United Heritage. Idaho Power is already saying those five-year-old fixtures are too energy consumptive. And, and we can trade them out and we can give you some money and we can take care of that. Now, why is Idaho Power doing it? I, I, does anyone know why they're doing it? Yes. It's a strategic <laughs> business move. And the strategic business move is that Idaho Power recognizes that their resource base is limited. And if a company comes into Idaho that needs a large amount of power and their existing infrastructure can't handle it, then they have to say, no, Mr. or Ms. Client, we can't accommodate your power needs. So by going out and upgrading all of these old power sucking buildings and you know, power hog projects, they're able to free up energy that can be redirected to new, clean, green, um, progressive um, organizations. And, and what does that do? That means people move into Boise, they move into the state, they bring new jobs, they bring new things. I mean, it's a, it, you know, at a, at a high level, it's a pretty simple formula, but it, at the bottom line, we all benefit from it, and that's one thing that we can take to our clients with a very willing partner in Idaho Power. And I think that's, um, that's a, you know, that, that makes our job, you know, initial job really quite easy when we can say right off the bat, we Thank can bring for, incentives. For bringing out that piece, Andy. Appreciate that. That's good. Um, we're closing up here in about six minutes, and uh, I wanted to ask for questions. And Greg had one, and Reed has one. So, I uh, agree. Uh, any second. of you, it's a kind of an opportunity and a barrier question at the same time. But uh, what's the opportunity locally for uh, deep renovation to net zero, and what are the local barriers to uh, deep renovate to net zero? Uh, deep renovation to net zero. Um, well, the the whole concept of getting to net zero is, you know, that's a challenge. I mean, I mean, to get there is just to develop the formula to 
achieve that goal. That's, that's your first issue. Um, but as far as just, you know, just within the existing structure of the world, um, you know, Idaho does not lead the U.S. in offering um, incentives. Um, you know, if you've been doing any research on incentives, and I, I have been looking at some of the surrounding states recently, um, we don't have much, and it would be nice to see some of those incentives in place, you know, either through local incentives or statewide incentives through, you know, and I don't want to talk taxes and all that, but there, there's got to be a way to, to push in that direction. Um, and I think that's important because you just have to just accept the fact that people respond to that, developers do. Okay, good. Thanks, Chris. Reed, what was your question? Yeah, I wanted to ask Andy uh, what, what uh, some of the challenges are to uh, deep renovation of historic buildings. Um, a couple of day get, days ago, I was in uh, Boston in Stefan Banish's Genzyme building, which, as you know, was one of the first uh, lead platform buildings. Might have been the number one. Uh, it's the second time I've been in that building. It's a gray overcast day, and it was the light and air was really beautiful, even you know compared to the sunny day uh, when I was in there the first time. But that's a brand new building. Uh, you go a mile away uh, to the Harvard campus, and Renzo Piano is renovating the Fogg Museum. If you can imagine, this is this is a Shepley Bullfinch 1928 building, uh, right by Le Corbusier's. Uh, famous building uh, between that and the Harvard Club. And so, uh, Monday when I took pictures of that, I could see the walls. I took three walls and, you know, braced them all up. And Renzo Piano is coming out of the back sides of that. So presumably, when you go down Quincy Street, it will still look like the original uh, Neo-Georgian building that it was. But now it's going to wrap around all uh, of the other part of the building. and. Uh, I wondered if you are familiar enough with Renzo Piano's previous work to know if this is going to be some astounding sustainable <laughs> design or if in fact that's very difficult to do in a historic building. And I know you've done some work on that. So could you comment on the, those problems a little bit? You know, I, I, I'm going to have Bruce talk to it also because you did the first lead renovation uh, in, in the state. Um, and uh, while we're looking at historical buildings, we're looking at a very topical applications. And, and I say topical, you know, new windows, new frames, maybe some new openings, getting some more natural light deeper into the space. We're looking at um, improvements on an old geothermal uh, system. And I, when I say old, <laughs> Charles will confirm old system, very inefficient. Um, you know, the, the, the deep renovations that we look at are, are renovations that aren't blowing out whole walls and they're not blowing out um, prime historic elements of the building. Um, the, other, the other challenge that we have here in, in Boise is that, um, you know, we, we have to deal with the Historic Preservation Co Commission and, and um, I think they, they try and do a great job, but I don't think you can expect them to think um, really far out where you could incorporate the designs of Lorenzo Piano on a 1920 Stephanie Bullfinch building. I mean, just, you're just not going to get there. Um, and so that's a challenge in this jurisdiction. It's a challenge, I think, what you're going to find uh, more regionally in, in the Treasure Valley and maybe even st statewide that. Um, Old buildings are old buildings, new buildings are new buildings, and when they collide, uh, we try and avoid that collision. So that's an aesthetic discussion. It's also an application discussion relative to the deep renovation components. And um, I, you know, I don't know what kind of headaches you went through just trying to put awnings on the, you know, your shade structures on the buildings at Front 5. Well, you know, I can, you know, I can tell you, let me, let me talk. Uh, at the national level, what's going on between the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National USGBC? About, I, I was uh, for 10 years, I was on the Preservation Idaho board and I was the president for three years. And during that period of time, when we were first starting out at the USGBC Idaho, I had the opportunity to invite Rick Fedrizi, the CEO of the USGBC, to Boise, and he came. 
and we held a, I, I, oh, I called it the USGBC networking conference. And I don't know, some of you may have been there. We had it at Idaho Power and invited school districts. We had about 250 attendees. And I intentionally at the same time invited uh, a representative of the National Trust out of San Francisco who represents the Western US to this. And we had a roundtable discussion with historic preservationists and with Rick Fedrizzi, I mean, the top guy of the USGBC. And so it was a very interesting discussion. Since that, and I'm not saying this started at the discussion, but there are a lot of commonalities between sustainability and historic buildings. I mean, how if you want to be sustainable, save your buildings. And at the, at the highest level now, they've got committees working on, on the, with the National Trust and the USGBC, they're working together to get through some of this because of how the how you the how lead may potentially impact historic buildings. So I think it's on everybody's radar is to have that discussion and it is happening. I don't know what the answer is exactly yet. You have to be as an architect you have to be somewhat sensitive to that. You have to be sensitive to it. So um, so it is six o'clock, it's time for this to end. I uh, really want to tell you how much I appreciate this panel and your information, uh, really good professional information on this, on this topic. Your questions out here in the audience on behalf of the Integrated Design Lab, uh, Better Bricks, Idaho Power Company, Northwestern Energy, thank you all for attending this fall session. This was our final one. We'll have uh, a series beginning again in the spring. Gentlemen, thank you very much Thanks. for attending tonight.